That's a uh, really beautiful hymn that actually covers a lot of the things we think about Jesus. It goes all the way through because uh, although we remember at this season his birth, we also think of the person, all he is and all he came to do. And that's interesting. Even in the carols, the older carols, you hear so much of the of the good theology don't you it comes through there and even though there is a, a trend by some people to take christ out of christmas and to take even the name christ out of christmas there still we find that in the public domain carols and so forth at certain times of the year it comes out quite boldly so it doesn't get stopped and people still use the term merry christmas in spite of what some people would like to say that it's going out the window and so forth. I wanted to look at a passage today which is a really wonderful passage that uh, I think um, is one of the most uh, glorious songs, if you could call it that, in the, um, uh, in the, in the New Testament. Uh, a song that Paul cites in Philippians chapter 2, a song that... Uh, that could have been predated him, but he had the brains and the spirituality to develop it in himself anyway. Uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. It says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. To understand why Paul quotes this beautiful song or writes this beautiful song we need to understand the context in which it is placed and Paul uses this continually often cites something about Jesus to explain something that people should be doing or adhering to and in the chapter before and in the first part of chapter 2 you find that he is exhorting the Christians at Philippi to act in unity together and you find that unity true unity is based on humility and on service and that's why he brings these things out from the example of Jesus true unity is not that everybody thinks the same you know someone has said if that happens big brothers are doing all the thinking that true unity is when we agree to be able to understand where another person is coming from. In fact, true unity is probably the basis of true democracy, where people actually listen to what somebody else is saying and the majority doesn't force their opinion on other people. It's you know, where we listen. We've got a proneness as human beings to want to say what we want to say, to do what we want to do, and not really take into consideration where other people are coming from and so forth. Someone has said, the old saying, seek first to understand, then to be understood. It's, a, it's something that I've used a lot in industrial ministry because it's good to be find out where people are coming from before you start to tell them where you're coming from. You have a better form of contact. Humility. Humility is well with Jesus uh, he was God and when he came to earth here he didn't cease to be God he just chose to put to one side 
his rights as God, all right? And there are examples we could find uh, in life for this very thing. I only can think at this moment of my father, Reg Vines, missionary to China, when the communists were coming, many missionaries claimed their rights. We want to get out, so they got in touch with either the Australian consulate or the British consulate or the American consulate and said, get us out, get us out, we don't want to be here. But Dad said, no, I'm here for the people, and he decided to stay, and we were under communism for two years. A lot of the Chinese Christians, when missionaries got up and left, said, well, they weren't really one of us at all, were they? Because when the, when the, when the dirt hit the fan, <laughs> they uh, simply got up and went, you see. But Dad stayed there, and we finally only left China because the commies wanted our house, and so they kicked us out. But uh, Dad, was, Dad said, no, I'm here, I'm staying. He stayed, and there's a lot of stories that go on about what happened while we were under the communist control there in China. Laying aside your rights, that's what Jesus did. You know, he, he could have acted in his own power, but he came here as a true man to act under the power of the Holy Spirit. He chose to do that. Why? Because of us. And we found that he didn't see the position he had as something he had to hug to death. Like the kings of the Old Testament, they, when they became king, they hung on to being king and they would persecute, kill and butcher anybody who even looked like a threat to them. That was the way of the world. That was the way it happened then. It's the way that it happens today. When people get into control and they don't want to lose power, they will wipe out any opposition they can probably find to that. It's the sort of way. But Jesus was different. He didn't have to grab onto that. It shows one of, the, one of the characteristics that was Jesus, one of the characteristics which comes through, should come through for us as Jesus people or Christians, right? In service, of course, he showed this. When he was called before, the, for, before Pilate, the people of Israel, the people that were there cried out, they chose the power man, they chose Barabbas. They didn't want Jesus. They didn't want his way. And Jesus said, if my kingdom was of this world, my people would fight because it was a different kingdom. But sadly, down through the centuries, the church has gone and done exactly what Jesus said we're not to do, and they've become power agents and so forth. You see, in Revelation, and I can remember we covered that here one time some a couple of years ago, and in Revelation there you find there was only one case where it mentions Jesus as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. In fact, the only case in the whole of Scripture where Jesus is identified as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Otherwise than that, 27 times in the book of Revelation, he is classified as the Lamb. And if you want to see where God is working in the world today, don't look for the pug mark of the, of the Lion. Look for the footprint of the Lamb. Right? Because God's working. You know, we think... Oh, God's left us alone. Beam us up, God. Bring on the rapture. You know, everything's going down the tube. No, you know, I reckon we live in a time of unprecedented opportunity to reach people because people are hurting. And when people are hurting, they need Jesus because he's the only final answer for hurting people. Is that right? We know it's right. Okay. All right, we get into this here. And we find out the difference between the way of the world and the way of God and so forth. We find that this passage deals with Jesus as the example that Paul holds up for the Christians at Philippi. It's interesting that people find it difficult to grasp the concept of being a leader and being a servant. It's very, very hard. In India, I did a training session some years back with a group of pastors, and they said, how can we be leaders and pastors if we cannot tell people what to do? How can we be servants? And uh, I said, look, it's not a case of the, of, of, of the gift. I said, if you're given the gift of leadership, if you're given a gift where you're in charge of people, it's, do you use that gift 
to glorify yourself and say, I'm a wonderful pastor, I'm such a great preacher, or do you use that gift to serve the people that God has given you with? I said it's as simple as that. There you have the gift of leadership, but you operate it in the role of a servant because your task and the gifting you've got is there to serve people. So it's something that they said, oh, we never thought of it like that. No, that is, you know, that is different. Indian weddings are different to our European weddings. And only where they have adopted the uh, European or the Western types of weddings. In a village wedding or amongst the Badigas and the hill tribes of the Nulgri Mountains, where I went to school many years ago, we went recently because we've gone back a lot with orphan projects, we, went, we had a, an invite to a Badiga wedding. And at the Badiga wedding, what happens is, yeah, well, let's put it this way. At a European wedding, at a Western wedding, you have the, the meal afterwards, the breakfast, whatever you want to call it. When it's breakfast at night time or whatever, <laughs> you, have, you have the wedding breakfast. And everybody doesn't, every, nobody eats anything until the people, the wedding party is served and they sit down and they eat and then you start to eat, right? That was the way we do it. But in uh, Badiga and a lot of other tribal groups in India, what happens is that you sit down to eat and the bridal party comes to serve you and they do not take a crumpet or a crumb until everybody has had seconds, thirds and fourths and is totally satisfied. And they say that we are, this is a time when you are our guests at our first meal together as a married couple and we want to show you that we're prepared to serve, right? As simple as that. So sometimes we can learn from other cultures things that we've kind of got arrogantly out of control with our cultures and so forth. But here it says that. So the, Jesus steps out of heaven. He comes down to here. He identifies with mankind. He becomes the, the one that's referred to in Daniel as the son of man and so forth. He makes the move. He makes the first move. God always makes the first move. In Jesus, he made the first move to come here to walk in the garbage of this world and to identify with us. He made the first move. And that's a pattern too. There's so many patterns here for the Christian of making the first move in restitution, restoration and reconciliation and all of those things that have become part of the after effects of the gospel and so forth. He is the one of the first move. And we find this, that he, he had came to identify with us. He became one of us, but without sin. He was a true human being. He wasn't a phantom. He wasn't a ghost. He was a true human being. And to be born as he was born, not in a nice sanitized uh, manger. It was full of you know, cattle droppings and everything else. You know, the cattle were there. It was a stinky place, right? I mean, at that time, of, uh, 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 in, in that time zone, the Caesar in Rome was starting to become, to get to the stage where they were starting to become deified, you know, to think that they were God and everything else. Later on in Luke's uh, thing, and with, by the time Luke was writing the Gospel of Luke, it had come to fruition. The, the emperors had become, the Caesars had become sort of uh, prone to want worship and so forth. So here we have human power, human arrogance at one side, and the real authority and power of the universe, a little helpless baby in a dirty old manger, right? Yeah, that's our God. Our God is a servant who's prepared to come here to identify. And the shepherds and everything that he identified, the shepherds were looked down on in that day, right? They, and, but you know, the Lord Jesus was um, uh, introduced by from the angels to the shepherds and so forth and so forth. There were things in the life of Jesus that lived out this concept of servantship. He came to be the suffering servant. We see it clearly as Christians when we look back. The Jewish people couldn't grasp it. They never saw Isaiah 53, particularly what we call the servant songs in the, in the center of Isaiah. They never saw them as relating to the Messiah and such. It starts off, O Israel, my servant. 
And of course, Israel, the first Israel, was Jacob, a person. The last Israel is Jesus because he came as Israel personified to do what Israel failed to do to reach the nations. God's commission to Abraham was to, uh, you know, to be a blessing out to the world. But they failed to do that. They became ingrown. They looked at their own spiritual navels. They ceased to be the people that God wanted them to be, to be a blessing to the world. Jesus came and he did it. And that's why in Isaiah, in those servant passages, it was so much more than could ever be applied to Israel itself. So much more. And we find the suffering servant there, particularly in Isaiah 53, don't we? Identifying something, something that was foreign to the whole concept that the Jews at Jesus' time believed about the Messiah. All they didn't sort of see the Messiah as needing to suffer. But Jesus continually, through his ministry, brought it up. And continually, even after his resurrection on the road to Emmaus, he uh, tells the two, he says, but wasn't it written that the Messiah must suffer? Right? He showed it. They said, he came, he did this. We thought he was going to be the Messiah, but look what's happened, you know. But they hadn't grasped it, even though he, the perfect teacher, had kept on telling them about it, which is a great encouragement, you know, if you're, if you're doing speaking, that if, if they couldn't grasp it from the most perfect teacher, totally spirit-filled, and they couldn't grasp the message from that, well, there's hope for us. But it also shows us the power of being what you're pre-taught. The ideas and stuff you brought up with are so hard to break, right? Because they're so ingrained that we almost identify them with holy writ, right? You know, I remember arguing with a, with a brethren elder once and, it, and uh, he used the word scriptural and brethren interchangeably all the time. And I said, I, I noticed you do this. He said, yes, because the brethren are scriptural. I said, but are they always? I said, it's a bit dangerous to say that because we don't know. There's a lot of things we don't know. He said, we've got to be careful we don't sort of do that. But anyway, Jesus was the suffering servant. He came to seek and to save the lost. That's the work of a servant. He came to serve and, and to give his life a ransom. And he said other things. They were the work of a servant, right? He came to do that and so forth. He came to be the shepherd. The big uh, ch challenge or accusation, you could say, that God had against the Old Testament people of Israel was not that they weren't good CEOs in business. They were. They always were very shrewd on the money thing, you know. But, but uh, you know, the thing was that God says, you're not shepherds. You're not shepherding my people. You're not shepherds. You're not doing that. That was a great thing. They didn't care about people. They didn't care about their workers. The whole range of things they didn't care about. They didn't care about their women folk. They didn't care about a whole range of things. It was all because of the fact that they didn't have the shepherd heart that God wanted to give them. They were not shepherds. And you find that we go through in the New Testament, particularly in John, and you find where the two things come together, being the Messiah and being the servant. We find it coming in, in John chapter 3, one of our favorite passages there, but it says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man, Messiah, be lifted up, suffer. The two things are brought together. As uh, Jesus reasons with Nicodemus, it says, Nicodemus, you've got to have a new start, a new start in thinking. And when Peter and them say you have to repent on the day of Pentecost, he wasn't saying give up smoking and drinking. He was saying you have to change your whole total idea and framework of mind about who the Messiah is and to see that Jesus is your Messiah, our Messiah. They had to see that. And they didn't catch that. They didn't see that. Then we have the example in the Last Supper. When Jesus, when the, the, nobody volunteers to wash anybody's feet, let alone Jesus' feet, and uh, you know, Jesus sees it, he takes off his outer coat, puts a towel around his waist, grabs a bucket of water, and he starts washing their feet. Now, it says something really interesting there in that passage in John. It says, knowing where he'd come from, right? Knowing where he was going, he knew who he was. No big deal. You know, half the problem why we up and try to push ourselves to the top 
is because we have a sense of insecurity about who we are. But Jesus never had a sense of insecurity because he knew who he was. He didn't have to prove it, right? He didn't have to go around proving it. He knew who he was. And knowing this, he went and did it. He didn't say, oh, these stupid disciples, they're going to let me down again. Here I go. I've got to go and wash their feet. They should have done this job. You know, don't we, we do that, don't we? Those kids, they never made their beds. And here I've got to do it. Go and make their beds again and wash the dishes. And all. We do it, don't we? But Jesus didn't do that sort of thing. He didn't need to. He just did it. He just went and served. Now, some of my Seventh-day Adventist friends, they have a, have a service where they actually do go washing each other's feet. But it doesn't mean we've got to actually do it. It means we've got to serve each other. The whole idea was, you know, that Jesus said, if, you, if I do this for you, you should do it for each other. You, you know, it's, it's a part and parcel of being a servant and so forth. This whole concept comes together as Paul tries to make his argument to the people of Philippi. If you should be, uni you should be unified in what's important, but if you're going to be unified in what's important, you need to be humble, and humility, true humility, is based on being prepared to serve, right? That's what comes through their time and time again. In the Malay language, they have a word for servant. It's called kakitangan. Kakitangan is very simple, but it means foot hand, right? It means you go where you're supposed to go and you do what you're supposed to do, right? It's a very simple sort of thing of a servant. And that's what Jesus came to do. It's an example. You know, if we, do, we were to catch the, the aspect of his love for, for people, we would find out that that was the heart of it. He came to serve. And the greatest act of service that Jesus did for us was the cross, wasn't it? He went through all of that. He didn't have to. He went through Gethsemane. He didn't have to, but he did. Right? There was no other way that we could be saved but for him to go to the cross and take the wrath for us, take the punishment for us, and that's what he did. He went to that cross, took the punishment, but the glorious thing was that he didn't, death couldn't even keep him down. And that's when we get through to Easter time, is death couldn't keep him down. The song we sung before talks about that. Death can't keep him down. He rose from the dead. He smashed the power of death. He smashed the power of Satan. And he came back to be alive forevermore. And it's a living Jesus we think of and remember this morning. We don't even remember him just as a baby. That was the starting process. But we remember him for who he is now, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's that little song we often sing. It says, Brother, let me be your servant. You know that one there? We often sing that one through as well. Now, it's interesting. It gets to the end of this. It says that, um, that uh, you know, every knee, every, every uh, tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, that's an interesting little phrase there because uh, you ever heard of the Septuagint? The Greek version of the Old Testament that was in was being used before the time Jesus came to earth here, right? The LXX, they call it as well. In that, the word that's translated, the Greek word that's used to translate either Jehovah or Yahweh, either one, whichever, they're both the same without the vowels put in, uh, was Kyrios or Lord. The same word is used here. So what is it saying, really? It's saying every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Yahweh all right you want to put it that way it could be taken otherwise as well and it says to the glory of god the father now let me ask you a question did jesus crown himself it says he was to be crowned did jesus crown himself no the father crowns jesus the father crowns him he did it you see uh, say it very carefully because sometimes people take take it wrong that God's purpose was not to make America great or Australia great or Israel great or Jerusalem great. His purpose in Jesus was to make Jesus great. Right? And that is the, pur that is the whole purpose that he came for, to be made great by the Father, not to make himself great. He didn't do that. He didn't set out to do that. He set that pattern for us. I don't know if you ever read any of uh, William Barclay's commentaries. 
of the of the scriptures and so forth but he has this on this passage now we'll finish off with this he says jesus won the hearts of people not by blasting them with power but by showing them a love they could not resist at the sight of this person who laid his glory by for people and loved them to the extent of dying for them on a cross people's hearts are melted and their resistance is broken down when folk worship jesus christ they fall at his feet in wondering love they do not say i can't resist a might like that but as the hymn writer says love so amazing so divine demands my life my soul my all worship is founded not on fear but on love and we love him because he first loved us i'll leave that thought with you let's just bow for a prayer father we just thank you and praise you for the example jesus has set the wonderful one that we remember at christmas time who broke into time here who came here for the purpose of serving us and for saving us for giving his life on that cross for us and we thank you for his resurrection that we serve a living resurrected lord jesus today and we commit each one of us into your hand on that basis in his name's sake amen